for having me here tonight. And thank you, Lori, um, and the Philadelphia Photo Art Center for inviting me to speak with you for the Thursday night photo talk. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna get my PowerPoint up and going here. Okay. Hey, is everyone able to see that? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> so tonight I'm gonna to be sharing uh, the, uh, with you the evolution of my work that attempts to see constructions of disabilities. And I will get a little bit more into what that means throughout the presentation. Um, I will also share some historical images to give context to the work. So I have always been a part of the disabled community and it is because of my sister, Jackie. And my mother actually took this photograph uh, with the four by five camera. Diana, my, yeah. we're still seeing the, um, the, not the full screen, but the, I oh, see are the you? slides and the, and I see your notes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so Sorry maybe just that. play the slideshow. You may have, well, I don't know. Here, let's see if that works. Is that better? Yep. Okay. We're rolling. Okay, let me, oop, I'll go back to the, sorry. There was the beginning slide. <laughs> right. All right. Um, so um, I just wanted to say here, my work refl reflects my experience of growing up with a sister with a disability, but my work does not reflect the experience of having a disability. And it's important to separate my work and the work of other family members like me from the work of disabled artists. Um, who are really in need of a platform at this time. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I have um, links for artists whose work is about disability. So that can be for your reference. Um, if you're also like a teacher, you can use that um, in your class for um, to show disabled artists. So I used different photographic projects in order to grapple with the idea of representation of disabled people and how that relates to our visual, visual culture and design. So I also want to mention tonight um, that I will be using what's called identity first language throughout my presentation. So instead of using the more widely accepted term, which is person with a disability, I will be using disabled person. So the disability community is working currently on reverting back to using disabled person because to them it's fundamentally empowering because it acknowledges the disability as part of an identity rather than making them separate from their disability, okay? All right. Okay, so in 2009, um, when I was an undergrad at Bowling Green State University, I began a documentary photography project at my sister's workshop. It was called Waycraft. My sisters, uh, I, I photographed her and her friends that attended the program for developmentally disabled individuals. I first photographed in black and white film using a Hasselblad camera, learning how to use flash along the way. I had many discussions with my fellow classmates as to whether this project exploited the people I was photographing. Some of the people uh, that I photographed were not able to communicate whether, they could, whether I could photograph them or not. I did, however, um, follow all the rules that were outlined to me uh, by the county board and received permissions from individuals or guardians that were photographed. The Hasselblad was important to this project because it allowed me to look down into the camera connecting more with the people that I was photographing. Being with my sister at her day hab was a wonderful experience for me and I recognized how important these places are for disabled people. However, she was very isolated from the rest of the community. My sister had a daily ritual of hugging her friend Keith every morning and she had attended school with him ever since they were three years old. They were always in this place together. Color photography became important to me in this project because I felt like it better defined the realities of the space and created a conversation between the space and the people that were photographed. The images were printed as 18 by 18 inch C prints made in a color dark room. I know not a lot of people get a chance to use a C printer anymore, but it taught me really how to see color and color shifting that easily translated um, to me to the digital world. 
Through this project, I learned about the civil rights of disabled people and how the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was my sister's civil rights, was signed into law in 1990 when she was eight years old. 30 years later, there are still many problems to be solved. So in 2010, I joined AmeriCorps as a recreation assistant and a Special Olympics coach. So I, at this time, wanted to make work that was meant to be more inspirational. I began a project called the Special Olympic Athlete. I coached volleyball, basketball, swimming, and track, and I made photographs of athletes when I had the opportunity. I love my job so much that I applied to the University of Toledo to become an occupational therapist because I enjoyed figuring out techniques and adaptations for people to play sports. At 22 years old, some of the people I was coaching had been playing the sport longer than I'd been alive. I thought about my role as a coach and how coaching puts you in a position of power. This is similar to the power a photographer holds when photographing their subjects. These questions led me into my next set of collaborations that aim to be more considerate of how I photograph people with disabilities. I questioned my role as a photographer, asking myself, how does photography misrepresent disabled people and how should I be taking photographs of disabled people? Okay. So I first wanna talk about a few images that represent the reality of our image culture and how disability is represented in the media. This group of images shows the idea of the super crip. So super crip overemphasizes ability in or, or, order to overcome one's disability. It also is an idea that has been used in movie characters to create a villain. So from physical traits like Freddy Krueger or an amputated limb like Captain Hook or a mental health disability like the Joker, also, movie narratives will use the idea of the super crip who has magical powers like Professor X or Daredevil. Super crip is about overcoming and exceptionalizing disability. So um, Eli Clare, who is a disabled theorist, wrote the book Exile and Pride. He explained his experience um, climbing a mountain and the sense of shame he felt trying to overcome his disability. He said, why did no one tell me it's okay to stop? How does society think that everyone's body is the same? He said the super crip is an overemphasis of ability that shames the disabled body. Okay. Stella Young, a disability rights activist um, who unfortunately passed away in 2014, used the word inspiration porn to describe reoccurring narratives that the media uses in order to show people with disabilities as inspirational only because of their disability. These posters, for example, the only disability in life is a bad attitude and see me, not my disability, downplay the identity of having a disability and doesn't recognize it as a real experience in a form of diversity. A lot of times it is the text interplaying with the image that causes the problem. In another example of inspiration porn, the world is changed by your example, not by your opinion, shows the heroic ableist and how disability is used to portray charity. It is prejudiced to assume someone with a disability needs help. Inspiration porn is made for an able-bodied audience to make them feel good that someone has overcome or cured their disability. Um, this image in particular had 764,000 shares. Okay. So the term ableism means the discrimination or social prejudice towards people with disabilities and the belief that having a disability is inferior to non-disabled. Disability is also a form of diversity, but is not often included in the diversity conversations. Okay, so how did we get to this place within our image culture? Well, these ideas originated out of the history of photography. The idea of the super crip originated from the freak show and putting one's disability on display by overemphasizing it in order to entertain. Photography was part of the success of the freak show and it was used for the fiction filled backstory in order to shock and awe the public. So this is a poster of Pip and Flip. So 
So one of the most uh, notable photographers that photographed the freak show was Matthew Brady. Matthew Brady was known for his Civil War photographs and his portraits of President Lincoln. It was little known that he worked for P.T. Barnum and his studio was across the street from the American Museum. He photographed the wedding portrait of Charles and Lavinia Stratton in 1863. Their popularity from the freak show made them celebrities. Okay. However, the freak show was both repressive and empowering to performers. Performers like Chang and Ng were bought and sold as slaves and their bodies were exploited. However, they also received sizable commissions for their performances um, and, pub and the public viewed them with admiration. But as the eugenic movement progressed in the late 1800s, the freak show began to fall out of style. It shifted the way people thought about the disabled body. Photography became a means of social classification similar to the study of physiognomy which was the practice of studying the head and facial features to determine character. Photographs compared and contrasted the physical body. Photographs became part of what Alan Sekula, um, a photography theorist called a filing cabinet, which subjected the body to a bureaucratic clerical statistical system. Medical photography used a system of documentation within a private medical practice to study the disabled body seeking a cure. The disabled body was devalued and subjected to experimentation in the name of health. Photography within a medical practice preserves the visual representation of the body and distinguishes normal from abnormal. Photography used in this way, similar to dissection or anatomical drawings, it provides prolonged access to the body. So in order for the camera um, to be used clinically in this way, it needed uh, quicker exposure times. Edward Moybridge invented the spring-loaded mechanical shutter in order to take photographs of moving subjects. He photographed Ossident the horse, um, which is, a belie I believe that's how it's pronounced, using quicker shutter speeds to prove the theory of unsupported transit. So um, unsupported transit claimed that when a horse was running, it had all four hooves off the ground. So Moybridge directly used the camera um, and he did prove that it, it was true. <laughs> so um, Moybridge used the camera for clinical practice at Stanford University where he studied movement in the human body. The images here were used for research in the development of prosthetic limbs. Photography was important to the history of human curiosity, experimentation and exploitation. Medical photography caused a shift to a new way of looking at the disabled body from amazement and wonder to something private and shameful. It is part of the history of photography that has created uh, this social construction on how we view disability, also called the clinical gaze. It questions the agency of disabled people who are photographed and the intent of the photographer. The inspiration porn that I showed at the beginning of the presentation both exaggerate and minimize disability to create narratives for an able-bodied audience. So I continue to think about disability as a form of diversity and the main challenge when including disabled people in our society. As an occupational therapist, I studied and interpreted the medical model for the purpose of rehabilitation. I learned that the medical model attributes disability to the body, a body that is broken and imperfect or otherwise unable to function in society. In this mode of thinking, when you change or fix the body, it will eliminate disability or cure it. The opposing view is a social model of disability. It believes that bodies are diverse and society has been based on an ideology of the human body that is unrealistic. It acknowledges that, most, that almost all people experience disability within their lifetime. It emphasizes the lack of consideration of disabled people in the social structures of society. It considers that disabled people have not had a chance to play a large enough role in the development of our society and our image culture. Okay. So in 2013, I began a collaboration with photography professor Lynn Whitney and her photography students and disabled adults from the Wood County Board of Developmental Disabilities. So I did this kind of at the end of um, my occupational therapy schooling. So students learned about how to do collaborative photographic work and taught individuals how to photograph too. 
I just have a small sample of images here, but the students displayed the work locally and even had a show at the Toledo Museum of Art. Okay. So here's Stephen with his cello by Elise Rowe. Dennis and Kristen by Jesse Renner. And then this is a group of the students work um, in the wall of the, I think it was the library. And then um, Lynn Whitney, the teacher participated too. And these are her images of Bethany from 2018. And then here's one of her other images from 2017. Um, so this year, the project has been unfortunately put on hold due to COVID. And I just wanted to mention here that Lynn, who was also my undergrad teacher, encouraged me to pursue this work in disability. And this year she's retiring after 33 years of teaching students. And she's been my mentor and my friend and I wish her the best of luck in her last semester. <laughs> so in 2017, I decided to attend the University of Missouri for my master's in art. It's a fully funded program uh, where I was able to work closely with Joe Johnson and Travis Schaefer. I also taught beginning photography for six semesters. I was in a new place and I wanted to explore ideas in photography about collaborating with people with disabilities. Except I was not part of the disabled community and it took me a lot of time to build those relationships. I wanted to take portraits that minimize my control as a photographer. This image is Katie and her dog. So I made flyers and attended local disability organizations asking for, for volunteers of disability activist groups that would be interested in collaborating for a photography project. Um, Jeff was the president of Boone County People First and volunteered to work with me. He picked the location of where he wanted to be photographed, which was in a local park. I set up the camera and made decisions about framing. Jeff was handed the shutter cable release and decided when he would um, take the image. This one here, we were taking an, uh, the picture with a, color, um, a four by five with color film. The shutter cable release represented power and choice admitting to the viewer that disabled people were willing participants and have agency in the photograph. Editing was also collaborative. Taking portraits in this way helped me to be aware of how many decisions and biases make up the power structures in photography and that there were also social norms that were playing into the portraits, especially when you do not provide as much direction. Okay. Amber pictured here stated that the media often misrepresents disability in a way that either provokes pity or uses disability as a plot device to portray people as heroes for living their lives. In reality, persons with disabilities are just people and disability is just another form of diversity. Okay, in my next project, um, I'm going to acknowledge the environment and how it doesn't always consider and include disabled people. I wanted to see if I could use my camera to see something that was invisible. I thought about the privilege and access I had as an able-bodied photographer. I found myself looking at images from new topographics where photographers like Stephen Shore often drove from city to city um, photographing how to, re or to redefine the landscape. I thought about comparing and contrasting photographic representations of access within this human altered landscape. So this is actually from Richland County. So I just wanted to kind of um, also show that when Stephen Shore went through <laughs> in the 1970s. Okay, I thought about uh, signage and about how blue, the blue accessible sign indicates a place of parking for disabled people as a sign within the landscape. I also thought about the sign as a label and how it permits access for the disabled community. This project is called Disillusion. It used the camera and the color blue to question our built environment, the objects within it, and how they relate to our bodies to reveal a social construction of disability that is otherwise invisible. Blue questions, accessi or blue questions accessibility 
and lead your eye to a particular part of the photograph. It becomes part of a typology to compare both objects in and of the landscape. So take this picnic table, for example, it is designed for the able body. A wheelchair user would not be able to comfortably sit anywhere at this table. If they sat on the end, they would most likely have to sit sideways and the benches do not move away to allow for someone to pull up to the table. It is able bodied by design. So the images here are first read as a blue study or kind of like a search and find Where's Waldo book in order to locate the blue objects. However, the work shifts, hopefully when the title is read, um, Disillusion, which indicates that there may be more to see. The title helps to question the color exercise. It can make the viewer aware of a different world, one where um, they can maybe see the obstacles in the environment. I use the camera to conceal and reveal ways of viewing the social constructions. I also made this uh, project into a book so the images are either on a wall as a grid or they're um, read consecutively. In 2018, I started to work on a project further exploring the idea of design and also the lack of beautiful photographs of uh, disability objects. I thought about product photography, still life in the history of medical photography. These images are mostly represented without the physical body, but references it through movement and the representation of the design of the object. I used objects that I had lying around from occupational therapy to explore the inclusion of disability in the design. This design here is a nosy cup. It is a well-established design um, that's made for someone that's unable to tilt their head back. It is a cutout that leaves space for the nose so the cup can be tilted without neck extension. The cup is not something you commonly see at the store, but it's common among um, occupational therapists or medical professionals. This, is, this here is one of my favorite images. Um, I'm thinking about the alteration of food. My sister cannot um, eat these grapes, but she does have an altered diet um, called ground. And growing up, I never saw images of other people whose food looked like hers. Um, however, there are many people in the world that eat altered food. So it's just kind of a, acknowledging that. Here I'm using 3D printed hand bones um, that occupational therapy students use to study the bones in the hand. And I'm using um, reflection to think about um, idealizations of the body. This is the other image I really enjoy from this series. Um, the mug is a well-recognized design with one handle, although occupational therapists can purchase two-handled two mugs for people that need it, the support of two handles. Um, but here I'm using a mirror that um, kind of almost looks like a piece of glass to question that original design of the mug. So another historical photographer that I have not yet mentioned and one of the most famous people to photograph the disabled community was Diane Arbus. Disability studies historians are beginning to recognize that her work needs to be reinterpreted. The image here was originally interpreted as covering or hiding the face, concealing the person's identity. So they, it was interpreted as exploiting the individual.
In 2013, critic William Todd Schultz's book, Emergency in Slow Motion, described and analyzed Arbus's life. She was criticized for exploiting others because she used her wealth and privilege to photograph. Schultz described this image here as disturbing. However, I question what is so disturbing about this image. To me, this is an ordinary family portrait, one that reflects the life of a family with a disabled child. Okay. So in my project, Making Wheelchair Tornadoes, I think about the current narratives of disability and how I would like to build a project that asks the viewers to reject the clinical gaze and the current disability narratives. So I met my friend, Matt Ebert in January of 2019. Matt grew up in Missouri, but went to undergrad at Kansas University and has his master's degree in philosophy from the University of Michigan. He volunteered to participate in this project and he invited me into his home. He proceeded to show me a silver gelatin print of a man with a beard standing on the street that was on his wall. It was at that time I decided to photograph with the four x five view camera using black and white film. Matt enjoyed looking through the four x five and he really enjoyed the way it enlarged my eyeball through the lens. So the first few images, so um, I had my, well, my thesis show was supposed to be um, in the middle of March. So we all know that didn't go very well. <laughs> so um, I haven't yet shown my thesis work. And so these three images um, are the first ones that I display in the project. And um, so these images stand in for historical representations of the clinical gaze. And it includes the history of portraiture, which can be both honorable and problematic, and also idealizations of the body. So these three images are displayed at 60 inches on the wall, which is the standard viewing height for images in a gallery. So 60 inches is based on the eye level viewing height of an able-bodied male. I display the rest of my work in this series at 45 inches on the wall, which is standard eye level viewing height for a person that uses a wheelchair. So first it was important for me to create a friendship so that we could both share and communicate ideas about our lives and the intersection of our experiences with disability. His direct, mine indirect. We made images without a particular agenda. We had discussions about the wheelchair being an extension of the body. That is kind of how this image came about. <laughs> Here I acknowledge Moibrid's ideas of human motion, but with the wheelchair. I use multiple flash exposures showing the synchronized motion of the wheelchair. So this is tilting. And I'm sure if you ask Matt, those was really fun to make. <laughs> Here Matt is swinging his necklace um, that has an attached screw which was a memory for him of his halo brace. So the halo, um, his, this screw was actually in his skull um, with the halo brace. And he also told me this story um, about how he wore a rubber snake around his halo brace to kind of break the ice with other students. Um, It is this humor and playfulness from Matt that brought about these wheelchair, wheelchair tornado images. The images are performative and tableau, but they are made with, within ordinary scenes rather, rather than fabricated sets and stages. The wheelchair tornado merges Matt's body with his wheelchair. Matt cannot control the setup of the camera and I could not control the motion of his power wheelchair. And we both could not control what would be recorded on the film. The four x five view camera works against the idea of making documentary images. It slowed down the process with manual controls but had the possibility for more error. The bulb setting was used with a deep depth of field and a slow speed ISO film to record these desired performances.
We also enjoyed finding these wonderful surprises, like in this image, how the light from his joystick aligned with the line in the parking space. So there was always these wonderful little surprises to find because we didn't know what would come out on the film. Here's another image that speaks to Matt's humor. And it's also an ode to Diane Arbus's a woman in a wheelchair photograph um, from about 50 years ago. So Matt told me a story about driving around his neighborhood with a mask on to see if he could scare a few people. He said, people don't expect me to be wearing a mask. So also here, he found it funny, rather funny, um, how many people were staring at me on a hot sunny day underneath a four by five dark cloth in the middle of a parking lot downtown, right across from a park. <laughs> so here Matt is using the shutter cable release with his right hand, ultimately controlling the exposure. Making this picture together was a very fun experience, one that Diane Arbus likely had too. Okay. So Again, I, I was um, thinking about the height of the work on the wall, and I had a conversation um, with one of my thesis committee members, Dr. Bowders, who is an engineer, and we talked about um, the lowered work, and we thought about how could we just accommodate all different types of viewing heights. So that's kind of how this movable frame came to be. So this movable frame, who I worked with a sculptor, Chris Mori, to help me kind of invent it. So it works with a 3D printed jelly button and the image slides up and down on the wall to, to communicate different viewing heights. Okay. This is going a little faster than how it would work, so. I also made a frame in collaboration with biomedical engineering students at Mizzou and Bill Janes, an occupational therapist also from the University of Missouri. They collaborated with me to make an interactive movable frame that works with facial detection. Okay, so I'm going to go over to a little video here. I'm gonna um, kind of exchange the share here. And everybody see that? Okay. So the design of this movable frame is meant to be equitable and flexible to each user and simple without the need of physical effort. The artwork accommodates the viewer without discriminating. And then here's an example of how it kind of works. The sliding mount functions when a person or small group of people approach the frame within five feet of the device. The camera embedded into the apparatus uses a Raspberry Pi with facial detection to determine the eye level height of the individual or group that is in front of it. The Arduino moves the linear actuator motor automatically without the use of fine and gross motor control. It is currently a working prototype. It is as simple and intuitive and it maximizes the perceptibility of the art information. The sliding frame utilizes principles of universal design for the promotion of social inclusion of disabled people. So just a little bit, a few facts. There are 65 million people across the world that use wheelchairs and 50 million disabled people visit museums every year. So this sliding frame considers this and includes them. I also wanna mention that many art galleries are not accessible and artist Jacqueline Romain listed at the end of this presentation did a project on the access of art galleries and photographed those that denied her access. Here's wheelchair tornado number five. 
And this one, you can see Matt's face in it, which um, we found very interesting. <laughs> Wheel marks. Okay. This image is called a race. So Eli Clare, who I mentioned before, um, he said there needs to be more representation of disabled people and just more photographs. Here is my own shadow cast upon Matt's spinning wheelchair, and it references the photographer's gaze and the subject's ambiguity. With the four by five film, it is surprises like these that are wonderful to see in the dark room. Moybridge's goal was to create certainty, whereas my goal is to create uncertainty and to question the camera's ability to prove anything about the photographer's gaze of the disabled body. No matter the situation, the camera is part of a power structure but I think that disabled people deserve to be represented rather than avoided. Through this project, I also made images that pointed out violations of accessibility. However, it was this image that did something more than just point it out. I, this image in particular feels like it's the world's kind of cracking open and it reveals this problem with accessibility but it also somehow feels like it's starting over. Photographers need to both include and re rethink the narratives that represent people with disabilities. We need more disabled photographers and more representation of disabled people. With Matt, I aim to create a visual commentary to highlight the space between people with and without disabilities to create ideas and imagery that represent disability. So I do not consider my work to be about the disabled experience. It is more about trying to see invisible biases that are all around us. Living with my sister, she taught me to see and pay attention to discrimination that exists both in our world and in our image culture. Eyes and cameras may serve to describe the world accurately, but vision remains clouded by perception. And then here are some links to um, some disabled artists that are working in contemporary photography and art for your reference. And then here is another list of advocates or family members that are um, working about the or work, working within the topic of disability. Okay. All right. And then this is a picture Matt sent me just yesterday of that same tree. So. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I will take any questions that you have. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's just so far, there's just uh, uh, a, a question and a comment. Um, uh, Kevin asks, what is the name of the book that you showed? Oh, it uh, Disillusion. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then um, Jackie, uh, oh, uh, Jennifer wants us to share those links. Maybe you could send them to me and I can share yeah. them in our, in our follow-up email tomorrow. Okay. Um, and uh, Jackie says, even a non-wheelchair disabled uh, would have a problem with that, with ambulatory sitting at a picnic table. Mm -hmm. She says, my challenges with MS would be an issue too. Um, and Juanita, and feel free to um, unmute yourself as we go through, but um, there are now the questions are coming in. Have you talked with any museums about using the sliding frame? That's from Juanita. <laughs> well, not, I mean, I've tried, I, I uh, showed the frame at the Occupational Therapy Association. They had a inventor showcase and that happened in June, um, but that's really about 
Um, the only thing that has occurred between now and when I was finished, <laughs> when I completed it for my thesis show. And um, there is another gallery that is going to show the work, but it, it's been um, the, they're kind of waiting until COVID is a little bit, <laughs> till it's over, until they can show the work, so. Yeah. Um, Not yet, but hopefully. <laughs> uh, just along that line, um, and as somebody who um, uh, created an exhibition um, that was meant to be accessible to, a photography show that was meant to sort of provide accessibility to the visually impaired, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, a, a specific lift, like, you know, you have to, you know, in order to increase accessibility to visual arts, there's just all kinds of ideas and, and thinking around it. Um, and uh, it tends to, it tends to, um, like I couldn't imagine doing what we did for the blind and the people with visual impairments and also for the um, hearing impaired and do the, 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 you know, the moving um, picture, the picture frame. Um, <laughs> we created desks though, that wheelchairs could slide under um, and could access a print file, so, so to speak. So we yeah. did do some things, but there's like, there's so many different ways to, to even get audiences, able-bodied audiences to continue to think about this and to continue to, re request it and ask for it and ask if it's not there, why is it not there? Yeah, and I think it's um, more about conversations with um, disabled people. Um, I had, um, fortunately I was able to go to a meeting um, at the St. Louis Arch that <laughs> involved um, over 20 people with disabilities where they were talking about redesigning the museum. And it was just this table with, um, like people who were um, supporters and different activist groups that all met together to figure out how to design the museum. And they were, they considered all these different um, suggestions. And that's the kind of thing that I think um, needs to start happening. Like, I don't think there's one solution that can solve all of the issues. <laughs> yeah. I, Diana, um, I'm sorry, can I, can I just say it for a second? Diana, I wanna, I wanna thank your, your uh, partner there, Matt. Who yeah, he's like he's on there tonight. <laughs> he, he deserves so much of the credit too. I mean, he's he's such a wonderful partner to work with, and just seeing the syner the, the, the synergy between the two of you, um, I, I'm just enthralled with the idea of the wheelchair tornado. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where where do you see that going? And then I have a second question about the food that was in one of the photos, the grapes. This is something, I've never seen anything like this. And I want to know more about that because I want to, you know, obviously know more, but can you first, let's talk about the, the, the direction <laughs> and then can we talk about the type of food because that really struck me. Okay. Yeah, so the wheelchair tornado is almost meant to be a kind of trope in itself. Um, as like, try, we were almost like trying to create a new trope um, in a way. So that's why we kept like repeating it throughout this series. And I mean, it, it's just something that kind of happened between the two of us. <laughs> and, um, and then, and, and um, like, I, I know it's Matt that originally called it a wheelchair tornado. Um, so he definitely gets the credit with naming it. Yeah, it's and, methodology, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you to Matt for all of the time and effort spent um, with this project. It, he's just been awesome to work with. So I'm sad that I don't get to see him all the time anymore, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> living in different states. Um, so, so the food um, photography work. So I think when you consider ideas um, within the scope of disability, like just opening up the world to that, like opens up so many more ideas and possibilities. Yeah. of rethinking design and rethinking ways of taking images. And, and I think I, I just, um, since disability is part of my life, like there's a lot of my experience uh, growing up with my sister that is just not there. And I think some of the things that 
I photograph is just trying to um, put some of my life into the image culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Wonderfully done. Um, <laughs> I wanted to jump in and um, ask a question that uh, when you mentioned um, Shannon Finnegan and how she uses the benches mm -hmm. um, in gallery and museum spaces, um, sit if you agree. And I think um, in looking at some of these questions in the chat about the frame, it's such a um, powerful piece of art in itself. And the question of wanting to have it um, accessible to museums to use as this, you know, but I, I was wondering if you could just speak to how you view it as you see it in the same light um, as someone like Shannon views these benches as just like a very powerful piece in itself that um, that I mean you would use in your work as opposed to making it I don't know a like marketable or a more widely used thing. Yeah, and um, I don't have the means to make it marketable, anyways. But yeah, it's it is. I guess for me, it was more about the piece. There, it was the point of like does the photograph have to be on a wall on the wall at a specific spot and just just the ability to move up and down questions that and um i think kind of points out that you know somebody has to look up all the time at a photograph and i mean even um there are so many other populations too that um just even considering the height of the standardized height. So like sometimes it's 58, sometimes it's uh, 60, but if we kind of average those, then it's a little bit more universal for everyone, including, but you can't ever make it completely universal, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, I think, um, I, I always have wanted to have six of the frames though. So I have this idea for um, to have three on each side of the wall that kind of talk to one another. Because um, I guess, um, yeah, I just want it to be mobile. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, thank you. No, I just wondered how you yourself viewed it because it is such like a, you know, it becomes a, about, it's like also, it's an art piece, but it's also about this like technology that you've kind of, you know, used a collaborator with to, you know, to come up with. So I just wondered um, how you viewed that. And yeah, that answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and it's also uh, white to try to fit in with the gallery wall because we wanted it to be as invisible as possible, so. Um, Rosanna's got uh, lots of questions. I'm going to read them all. Do you only work with four by five cameras? What, how no. costly is the movable frame? And what do you plan to work on next? Okay. Um, so um, I work with all kinds of cameras and you saw that I kind of worked on multiple projects and I did a lot of these projects at the same time um, sometimes. <laughs> and I use different cameras to kind of separate the different projects in my head. So the blue images uh, was like a little digital rangefinder camera and the, um, the images in the studio were a digital camera. And then I was using the four by five to photograph Matt. Um, so I, yeah, I kind of geek out on cameras a little bit and I love using the four by five, but um, the images with Matt and um, then I used the Hasselblad for the earlier images of, um, at Waycraft. So I, I like to use different cameras. <laughs> and then, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, you're, you're oh. doing great. <laughs> the, the cost of the movable frame was $500 because the biomedical bio, uh, engineering students only had that much money to use to spend on the cost. And some of that cost went into supplies that we didn't end up using. Um, so we were trying to get it, the price point down as far as possible. Yeah, please, if anybody else has um, questions, I'll keep reading them. But um, Jim asks, are you interested in exploring any video? Um, I have explored video, um, but I just haven't found, um, oh, I haven't found my place in it yet. 
Oh, and I think um, I think the person that asked before asked about what I was going to do next too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to explore, I, I would like to further um, dive into the studio images. That's something I wanna do. And then um, I wanna photograph my sister, but that's been the hardest thing for me personally. Um, I, I just, I have to do all of these things in order to know exactly how I wanna do it. So um, it's just something that I haven't done yet, but it's something that I want to do, so. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, can I go? Yeah, okay. Um, Diana, this is amazingly, whole, I mean, you come at this at so many different, levels and ways and and it just there's so much there really impressive um Thank my you. question <laughs> is <laughs> sure um my question is about um you know i wasn't sure i was gonna go i look every week and see who's presenting and i and i went to your site and i was just like oh my god these are incredible on so many different levels anyway my my um my question is is actually about your sister is she aware of the extent to which she has you know, impact it affected the, your work. I mean, I, um, I don't know if she's able to understand that. Um, my sister is not able to speak. So um, that we really connect through photography because um, it's kind of without words. And um, so I don't know if I'd ever know, but I feel like we do, so. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I have statement. Am I on? Am I yep. speak? Okay, great. Hi. Uh, they're, they're wonderful. And I thank you for, um, for all of your projects and, and doing it at the same time and, and showing um, the ability of everyone. Uh, having been part of um, the early 80s, when it was deinstitutionalization in mm -hmm. Massachusetts, um, the photographs that were being taken, which I don't have, I didn't own them. You had permission from people, but it really was um, the individuals that I was spending time with who were coming out of the institution was really more so that they could make the statement that I am here, you know, and I am, you know, I'm in the community and I'm out and, and for all different reasons. And I never got to go past that with those individuals, but I don't have those I don't have those photos and this is just, um, it's wonderful to see um, people participating in taking photographs and sharing their lives and for fun. And I am sure your sister is going to enjoy every moment that you spend with her taking her portrait and, and sharing that then further on. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Anybody else have any questions? There's more in the chat. Um, I do, if that's all right. Sorry, yeah. Hi, um, nice to uh, meet you. And I really enjoyed your presentation and the extensive okay. background on disability history. Like that was very awesome. Um, I'm Thank curious you. if you, and like that, the education background was amazing there. And I appreciated how you went over like the, dis the different disability models. Um, and I do have a question. So I wrote it down in the chat. Um, I'm wondering if you know of any resources that support disabled photographers like um, or artists like uh, grants or fellowships that you'd recommend looking at? Um, I know, well, they have um, like the arts commissions a lot of times have grants for um, disabled artists, um, but there are some organizations that I have seen before. I don't have one offhand, but like Opulent Mobility that's listed there and um, the podcast uh, might kind of connect you with that. Um, but there are lots of grants out there for um, oh, disabled artists. Correct. Just a heads up on that. <laughs> They're loud. Oh. <laughs> no, I, by the way, just a heads up. So I shout some things, but I mute myself most of the time. So we're fine. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for, the, um, for those resources. Yeah, I took some screenshots of that page as long as that's cool with you. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> So you said the opulence and who else and who else? Um, there, there's a podcast that I listed there that they might talk about that. But I know like the um, Ohio hasn't. I, I don't know what each state has, but Ohio's Arts Commission 
um, right now currently has a um, grant for disabled artists um, to apply. So thank you very much. They're there. Just yeah, it's it's hard to find mm -hmm. things, but <laughs> maybe yeah, if, you, I, if you connect with me, I can try to help you. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be awesome. Um, I can link my information in the chat. Okay. <laughs> That's great, and um, and uh, it would be great to share some of the links that you you gave us um, in a follow up email as well. Um, anybody else have a question for Diana? I'm curious about this tree. Um, it seems like a very important tree. It's certainly majestic and and does take all of your attention. <laughs> well, is Matt, are you still on there? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> so what, why, why do you like this tree so much? You think if you're willing to share that with everybody? <laughs> well, yeah, I, as I, I think, you know, when this tree first became <clears throat> sort of a thing for the two of us, I, I, when we were in this park doing some different pictures, and we were walking through large parts of the park in order to explore, yeah, explore just different back backdrops. Um, I had said that there was this one tree because I've lived in this area and I cut through this park on my way to a grocery store. So every week, you know, I, I pass this tree and there's one particular angle at, as you approach it where it just it's always when it's in full flourish, it's a square. And you, know, you can sort of see it there. And then that that kind of picture of it in the fall here where it's got some orange and red in it. Um, it, it just from. The, yeah, it makes this almost just perfect square like it's been manicured. And I mean, this thing is probably 50 feet tall. It's huge. <laughs> and uh, so nobody has shaped it this way. And if you go around it and you come from the other side, you don't get this squared off effect. But every time I would pass this thing on the way to the store, I'm, I'm always greeted with this angle. And it just was something that I found myself a couple of times a year taking a picture of. It was my square tree. It was just this <laughs> thing that I, I always used to love to come down and see, always from this uh, angle. And I was on my way to the grocery store just a few days ago and saw this. And I thought, oh, well, I know Diana will remember this tree. And now it's got a slight bit of color to it. And mm -hmm. so I just took the picture and sent it. And I don't even think I sent a caption to it. I just knew when she saw it, she was going to think, oh, there's the square tree. <laughs> and, uh, and then while we were trying to take some pictures, we were near there. And I went off into the grass and got stuck in a wheelchair in the grass. And if you remember that, some people stopped and helped push us out or push me out, um, which was really kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> That we we just that sort of tree I think had been a thing of mine for years and then there was someone else that I was with one day in the park where I could say see that tree that's the square tree to me and and then I think we took some pictures right around there and uh, just had a great time every time we were anywhere we were always having fun uh, it was I think what 15 months or something that we sort of worked on on this whole thing and. Yeah, of course, for me, all I had to do was sit there or put a mask on or, or do something goofy. And it was never not fun to me. There was no work about it. You know, I tried to do most of what I thought she might want for her purpose in taking an individual picture. But she was the one that had to mess with all the settings. And, mm -hmm. and you know, being the four by five camera, you don't get that immediate little screen showing you what you just got a picture of. So she would have to say, oh my God, I'm really excited about this one, but I won't know until I'm in the dark room. <laughs> you know, and then I'd be saying, you got to text me the minute that you're in the dark room and you develop this thing, so I have to know if it came out or not. And um, so there was sort of a delayed excitement and gratification with all of it. And then she would come over almost weekly and bring me small copies of them and say, oh my God, look how this turned out. You know? <laughs> and so it, I, I was just thrilled to participate in, in it. And, you know, it, it got me out of the house, which was great. It got me to interact with an incredibly intelligent and driven person who really had a, a focused goal in mind with the project that she had put together. And I just felt blessed to be a part of the whole thing. And I still do. And then, you know, I feel like 
I made a, a pretty dear friend in the con in the course of this uh, span of time. And uh, yeah, it was a it was a sad day when when Diana moved out of town. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that's the great thing about technology of this sort is we can not only talk on the phone, but we can Zoom or we can you know Skype or or FaceTime or whatever, and actually get to see and hear each other, which think we're probably going to do this weekend if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so that gets far afield from the question about the tree, but. Uh, <laughs> it was a journey that I, I appreciate. Matt, thank you so much. Um, it was great to hear your perspective and to hear more details about how much work it was. Cause because of the, just the, of the, the tools that you guys were using and I, it's good to hear um, a little bit more detail too. Thanks for that. Um, and that tree is pretty spectacular. So very cool. <laughs> when she showed one of the wheelchair tornado pictures, the one with a bit of my actual face somehow in it. I, how big is that one? She's got, she gave me a framed giant copy of that. It's, big, it's the biggest thing I have hanging on the wall uh, <laughs> anywhere in the, in the <laughs> service. And it's fantastic. You know, and and it's amazing because people come in and they see that and immediately it's a conversation starter. And that's kind of the whole thing that is just amazing about, you know, the photography of this is it starts a dialogue mm. of, a, and it might not necessarily be about being in a wheelchair at first, but invariably somebody says, Oh my God, you know, how fast were you going? And was this dangerous? And I remember some, some of Diana's students, I think, in one of your classes thought of the one where I looked like I was going a thousand miles an hour, tilting back and coming forward. Just They thought, oh, my God, is he OK? Like, I think they were worried about my safety and the whole thing. And <laughs> not knowing that it takes about 90 seconds to do one full tilt back and come forward again. And yet you see the image and it looks like it's at light speed. Um, so it's it's a neat thing. People see those images and immediately have questions, whether mm. they're disability related or photography related. Mm. Mm. But invariably, the two are melded together in this whole project. And so when any question of any sort comes up, it comes back eventually to that core issue of the melding of the photography and the imagery of, of disabled people. And uh, I, I did not know exactly. I was given the rudimentary idea of her vision of what this project was going to be and be about. But, you know, I, I didn't know just along the way how, what, no pun intended, but what was going to develop. Mm -hmm. And then every week she would develop the film and bring pictures. And a, a clearer image of what was going on started to emerge. And it just became something that wasn't just meaningful to me from the standpoint of having something to do and having a, an interaction with a, a, a thoroughly decent and kind person. But I really became kind of honored to be a part of the dialogue that, that my, my portion of my pictures will help to cr create or generate when people get to see it and it's proper uh, showing, which of course COVID kind of knocked out. Like she said, they were supposed to <laughs> yeah. show it here in the third week of March. And as of the second week of March, everything shut down. And so there we'll, was- we'll get a show, We will get to show it again though. So I, hopefully when all of this is kind of, um, I don't know, I, I have hope yet. <laughs> of course. Oh, I do too. So um, bef we can continue on, but I do want to close I mean, we can keep talking, Matt. You're, thank you so much for bringing all you brought into this this evening as well, um, Diana. Uh, congratulations and thank you. And um, uh, there's lots of good wishes for you. I wish you best with your work and keep us posted. Um, for people who are still on the still on the call next week, uh, Don Kim is going to be uh, presenting uh, their work um, for the Thursday Night Photo Talk. So I welcome you back. Um, and there'll be information on our website about that talk. Um, again, have a good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for coming, um, uh, Diana, Matt, and everybody else. It was a great night. And, we, and it was really, really um, uh, profoundly um, um, 
inspirational and moving and educational talk. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> wow. All right, I'm gonna turn this up, but if, um, uh, yeah, Matt, rock star. <laughs> 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 tree. It was really cool to hear all that stuff. Um, uh, I guess I'm going to, um, if anybody else wants to talk to you, um, why don't you unshare your screen? Okay. And if you want to talk to people, I know that there's some people from your community here. Thank you for letting people know. Yep. <laughs> is my screen off now? Yeah, it is. Matt, yeah. your shirt rocks. Your sweatshirt rocks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I noticed it immediately. I was like, Mattology. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Cool. Well, um, I'm going to. I, I guess we can we can end now if you guys want to um, uh, connect later. But um, uh, thank you again for the evening, and I'll speak yeah. to you. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much for the.